Such a pleasure to be here with you today. If you're joining us online, and I saw we got people from Germany, people from Belgium, people from Canada, people from all over the place. I know we have people from India and Rwanda regularly. Welcome, guys. It's good to have you. Look, I just want to encourage our online team. You know, uh, we meet and we're so blessed to be in a situation where we can gather as a church. And we can gather in the same room. We can gather with very little restrictions at this stage. We don't have to wear even a mask at this stage. And I want to speak to you if you're in your living room or you're in isolation or you're in a lockdown situation right now. God's Holy Spirit is not locked down. And He can meet you exactly where you're at. So if you're sitting there and you're like, I wish I was in that room. It sounds like something's going on. Yes, something is. And the same thing can be happening in your room. So I just want to stir up your faith a little bit today. If you, how about we give our live stream uh, <laughs> congregation a hand? And now I am so pumped that you've joined us today because you've uh, joined us in week two of REACH. And uh, it's a, a teaching theme that we've called Missional God. And it's part of our REACH campaign. And uh, Ryan, last week, your message... I, I felt like at the end of your message last week, I just wanted to say you could preach that four times like over the next month because it was so good. <laughs> if you haven't heard, who was here last Sunday? It was incredible the way that you outlined God's heart for the world and the depth and the richness of what you bring with such an ease is such a gift to us. And so I'd encourage you, if you hadn't listened to Ryan's message, to make sure that you do that. And uh, part of what we did last week is we outlined all of our programs and initiatives that we do as a church that reflect our desire to be joined with God in His heart for the world. And uh, these are the things that we do intentionally as a community. There's heaps of things that you and I do just as individuals, but collectively, I would encourage you to understand and what we do as a church and what, what programs and initiatives we run so that we can be aligned with God's heart and His missional heart for the world. And, uh, you know, I'm, I work in our creative team here and I love this branding. Maybe get a wide shot for our online fam. See this branding here? I love it. Who else loves it? I love the color. I love the shapes. And, you know, when it first hit my screen, uh, when Amanda sent it through as a draft, I, ins I was like, yes, you've nailed it. Because she has taken a concept that is spiritual in nature and she's made it visual for us. And what I love about this branding is that the central circle here is of someone reaching up and someone reaching down. That is exactly what God has done in our heart and in our life, is it not? And then the next circle here, I love it because that is the city of Perth. That's our skyline. On Perth as it is in heaven. Every time I see that skyline, I'm like, come on. The third circle here is, uh, is our country. It's country. Beautiful, beautiful Uluru. And, then the, and as we go out, it's um, pictures of our planet from space. And this is what God's mission is like. It's not just for the globe. It's not just for you. It's for each and every part of who we are. It's for us personally, for us locally, for us nationally, for us internationally. And so today, um, I'm going to take that, that circle of the city of Perth. Oh, I love it. I love the city of Perth. And we're going to talk about, for just a couple minutes, about some of our programs and initiatives that we do in this city. And one of the things that I love so much is our ER program. ER stands for Emergency Relief. Who's heard of that here before? Yeah, it's part of what Fill the Pantry goes to. And uh, do you mind if I share a couple of stories with you? Yeah. Oh, come on. I love that. All right. So I was talking with our caseworkers this week. I was like, give me some stories. They're like, oh, it's so hard to think of them. Like two seconds later, I have like 47 stories. <laughs> just like this is their day to day. And uh, I, I was just marveling at what is happening in our meeting rooms and in our appointments through our ER program. And uh, there was a story of a single parent who'd come in a couple months ago and uh, they'd had a workplace injury and they had been off work for like over eight months. And so they'd had savings, but they have kids, and so the savings got drained pretty quick. They found themselves in a position where they couldn't drive their kids to school anymore because they couldn't pay the car registration. And so they were, they were one of our um, honoured clients. They came in and we paid their car rego. Their response was, I can't believe there's still kindness in the world. Whose kindness are they sensing? Another story is a caseworker at a hospital called us on behalf of someone who was fleeing domestic violence. And this person had been in uh, surgery when they woke up. They found that um, their property had been sold and the their accounts had been emptied. And in that place of such distress and such shock and, you know, this person, poor person's recovering. We were able to provide some food. We were able to, I think, some emergency accommodation. The email back from the caseworker at the hospital was like, tears of relief, you have no idea what you have done for this person's future. 
And I love these stories because they happen day in, day out in the offices upstairs. It's incredible what a little bit of kindness can do. And what I love about our ER program is obviously all of the stuff that we can do practically for our city because the need is so great. But what I love is the heart behind each and every person who meets our clients. They say, you know, our clients will never know that we pray for every appointment before the day starts. They never know that we pray for the room, but they feel it. When people have anxiety that's so bad and they come and they go, you know what, I don't, I don't know why, but everywhere else I shake, but here I'm not shaking. Whose peace are they sensing? The need is so great in our city. And if you, didn't, if you weren't aware of it or you, you don't know how to meet it, I just wanna encourage you that as a church, we're doing our best to meet this need. And there are people out there who need immediate relief for all sorts of practical situations, but they need honour and dignity as well. And that's what I love about our programs. That's what I love about our ER program. You know, um, I, the team, when I was talking to them, they said, you look, we know what it's like. You, you know, you're, not everybody is in the scene that we're in, you know. <laughs> they don't have access to all of the agencies and resources that we do. And they don't have the time to sit down with people and really hear a story and understand how is the best way that we can help. And so some, I, know, I know you would have been in this situation where I, <laughs> that I'm gonna describe where you pull up to the traffic lights and someone says, can I wash your window? And you're like, I don't have any cash. I don't know what I'm doing. Or you walk past someone, they're like, I would like some lunch. And you're like, well, I'm getting sushi. They're like, no, thanks. I'm like, <laughs> and you're just like, I don't know what to do. And uh, sometimes I, I feel like uh, I'm less equipped than I want to be to be able to meet the need that I'm seeing. And our team know that. So what we're gonna do is ushers are ready. They've got these business cards here. I don't know how many we have left, to be honest, because like the morning uh, service has really cleaned us out. This is a 5 p.m. problem. <laughs> but uh, this card here is to whatever the need is that you see in front of you, you meet that need how you normally do. But this card is designed to go alongside that. And it says here, it's like, do you need uh, emergency relief? We're able to assist you with food, food bank referrals, essential overdue bill assistance, toiletries, information, support, and referrals. There's space to write down an appointment time. Our contact details are there for Burzwood and for Joondalup. And I just love that um, our team know that sometimes it's hard to know what to do, so they want to equip you as a church so that you can be the church out in the community. So how about you give them a hand? So, so good. Now, if you miss out on one of those cards, we'll do a reprint. We'll have some more at info next week and you can take a few then. But I love how engaged our church is in our local community. I think it's beautiful. I think it's important. And uh, I, I know that for many of us, we are engaged in all sorts of different ways. And our, I, our film team has prepared just a, one of the stories um, to encourage you and inspire you to keep on doing what you are doing in the community. I know you're gonna love it. Let's check out Terry's story. Come and see my little chariot. This is my little girl that I use down the motorplex. Um, it's got everything. It's got a blower on the front. See the blower for the flashing lights, lights. It's even got a radio, stereo. John Day, the family gave me that. The motorplex gave me that's a, a drone photo of the motorplex which they gave me for Christmas two years ago, and they're just little awards they're giving me for down there. everybody. They, they actually show these at the Royal Show. You know, they wash them and, and blow dry them and all that. There you go. She's about 
11, 12. Don't, don't live that long. Her, we call her Mummy. She comes all the time. She's a beautiful little pet. I check about uh, once a month, but in uh, in summer I do once a month. I go. Actually, I sit down here yeah. in a corner and just watch them, and you can you can actually see them coming with a lot of pollen. Like from two hives, no, uh, th that one there's got two on it with another one top. I got uh, what three years ago. I got 200 kilos of honey. With the bees, they say, say it takes four million flowers to make four litres of honey. And each bee will only make a spoonful of honey in its lifetime. And when, when you look at the size, and I sit there and I think, wow, you know, my, my co contribution to, to the Lord down at the motorplex, and not just the motorplex, in, in my ministry, is very, very small, but it plays us a part where it all comes together. Hi, my name's Terry Dorrington. I'm the full-time chaplain at the Perth Motorplex. I've been in chaplaincy in motor racing for 27 years, five at uh, Claremont and the other 22 at the Motorplex. It was 27 years ago, a young boy by the name of Troy from a Christian family on a Friday night, he stood at the door in the kitchen and he said to Mum, we're going to Speedway tonight. She said, yes. And he said, if I die tonight, I'll go be with Jesus. She said, that's right. He was only six. Little did he know that he would die that night from a wheel that came off. I got a phone call to ask if I could help. Um, I'd been in the ministry, stepped out. I'm a plumber by trade. Then I went back. Um, and then I said, yes, I'd help. And they say, you know, the best way to learn to swim is jump in the deep end, which I did. And it was basically from there. After several years at, uh, in motor racing, I thought the blokes down there especially, the guys needed some sort of time when they could sit and just talk. We have a lot of guys come along, light a, an open fire, and then we just sit around and talk, bloke talk. Uh, as we say, chew the fat. Uh, and then we don't have any alcohol there, but they're allowed to swear for you because when guys get angry and they break up and get, they, they do. I want them to pour their hearts out but there's a respect there and, and we're allowed to bring scripture in. Well, that's part of the deal was that we endeavoured to bring scripture into it. And, and, uh, and you know the interesting thing about all this, nothing's different. To me, it's what Christianity is about. Just sit and talk and, you know, and chewing the fat, as we say. Support is very important. I think the biggest thing is to know people are praying for you. That's the biggest thing. That really gets me when people say, hey, what do you need to... What do you need us to pray for, whatever else? <clears throat> and my wife, Irene, just, you know, we're 52 years married this month in, in May. Um, I don't think I could have done it without her. I still can't do it without her. Um, yeah, she she's, plays a big part of, of looking after me. And when we have people come here to just come around to talk to me, she makes tea and coffee and um, my, my little, Yard, this shed is my little hide and hide away. And the other thing, yeah, I do have a lot of time. I just get alone by myself. This is this is my little hangout um, where I spend a bit of time with the Lord. Do you know, the greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and all your soul, and love your neighbour as yourself. Who's your neighbour? The bloke next door. Um, the lady next door, the, the whatever else. One of the, the problems that I see in, in myself promoting, uh, reaching out to people, especially as a chaplain, amongst Christians is a lot of Christians may tend to look at me and say, you know, the Motorplex caters for over 100,000 people. I don't want to do that. I can't do that. But that's where God's got me, Terry Dorrington. Not anybody else, but he's got me doing what all of us should be doing, just reaching out, whether it's to the neighbours, to the local soccer club, football club. It's like everything. You've got to start from the bottom. You've got to start building. You build a house, you clear the block. You get your foundations and then you start building up on it. This, this thing, 
The door was open because of the death of a little Christian boy. I love Terry's story, and I, th- I hope you find that encouraging. I certainly did. And, you know, last week we, um, we did like a snap poll in the room of how many people are uh, volunteering outside of the church in their local community. And we got those cards back, thanks to everyone who filled them out. And um, I was so encouraged to see that over two-thirds of our responses, people are out serving and volunteering in the local community. How good is that? And the responses range from people like Terry Dorrington, who serve and volunteer in the community full-time, to people who volunteer one hour a month. And I, I love what Terry said about his bees. <laughs> Isn't that such a good revelation? You know, the size of your contribution may seem insignificant, but in the hands of God, together, you can have a massive impact in your city. And uh, I'm just so encouraged by that. I think it's our call as a church to step into those places and spaces. And um, I know I've talked a a little bit about our programs today, and uh, I think it's valuable to do that. It's important to do that. But now I want to shift gears a little bit, because a church is so much more than the sum of her programs. And I want to encourage you today. I wanna encourage you in your faith. And if you know me, if you've heard me preach before, you know that there's nothing I love more than like opening up God's word, opening up the Bible, uh, getting a passage of scripture, encouraging you in your faith, equipping you in your faith to see Jesus um, come into every part of your life so that you can live free, you can live whole, you can live in step with him. I love doing that because the Bible is really uh, such a personal and powerful way that God speaks to each and every believer. Personally, One of the primary ways that God speaks to me is prophetically, with pictures and words and visions. And I felt extremely strongly as I was preparing for today to share one of those. Because I sat here for the last couple of weeks being like, God, I got nothing for this message on the sixth, hey? (laughs) Like there's so much I could say, but I just, you know, nothing's really like hitting me. Nothing's really jumping out at me that I need to talk. And he says, Claire, I gave it to you two weeks ago. I was like, that? And he's like, yeah. And here's the story. A couple weeks ago, I was down the front here in worship, and uh, I was praying for us, as many as our team do. While we're worshiping, often our team are interceding and praying for you. And the prayer that I was praying and the question that I was asking a couple weeks ago during worship was this, God, how do you see us? What is it that you are seeing in us as Riverview Church? What is it that you want us to be doing? What is it that you see and want us to be doing in this city? Are we on track? Is, are we sensing you right? Is there something that you wanna say to us tonight? And it was so funny, because clear as a bell, like straight out of the blue, I heard him speak to me. You know when you ask God a question and maybe you didn't realize when he answers you that you were expecting an answer? <laughs> And I, I, uh, I sat there and I listened as God said these words to me. He says, how do I see? I see every life a steeple. And I want every heart ablaze. And it was such an unexpected, vivid picture that I haven't been able to get it out of my head ever since. Every life a steeple, every heart ablaze. And you know, as soon as God said every life is steeple, I, I had this immediate image, as I'm sure you do in your head, of, of an older style church with those tall spires and the tall steeples. Have, you know, I, I love that. And I know that when you see a steeple, you're most likely looking at a church. It's like one of the things that tells you that this place is a house of worship. It's probably a place of worship for Jesus. And so you're sitting there and you're like, hey, I think, you know, you can tell what a church is when you see a steeple. And then I knew from my love of architecture, as soon as God said it, a steeple, I thought, yeah, I know, because I know that steeples are designed to aesthetically draw your eye upward. So when you stand at the base, at the front door of a church and you're looking, trying to look up at the top of the steeple, what do you do? You start looking up, up, up. Up, up. And some are so tall you can't even see it, but as you're doing that, it's lifting your eyes up, it's lifting your focus up, it's lifting your, your eye line up to, like you're meant to be looking at heaven, you're meant to be considering things that are higher than your ways. And so they're aesthetically designed to draw your eye upward. 
I said, I like that, God. I can get behind that. Every life is steeple. If we're meant to be here, we're, we're gonna draw people's eye up to you. I'm, I'm all about that. That's a nice picture. And then I started doing some more research about steeples because I thought, well, what, is there anything else to this, God? And I learned that the first steeples were modeled off like defensive watchtowers. And I thought, that is super interesting. So a steeple is a part of a church and it's designed to see out. That's fireworks for WA Day for those in the room. Don't, don't stress. All right, so <laughs> you're all good. So a steeple is a part of a church. A steeple is designed not only to be seen, but it's also designed to see out. It's meant to be a vehicle from which you can see what's around the church. Now, this may not be a word forevermore for Riverview Church, but I do believe that it is a prophetic word for us for now. And it's a timely word because we're talking about reaching into our local communities, our local context, and into our neighborhoods. You see, because if every life is a steeple, that means that every life in this room and online has been built and placed by God for a specific context, a specific purpose, and a specific location and situation. What's the purpose of be me being where I am, God? I don't know if you've ever asked this question. Why am I in this situation? Why am I with these people? Why am I in this suburb? It's such a hole. Why am I here? And you know, I know you all ask these questions of the Lord, like, Lord, when are you gonna move me to Mosman Bay? <laughs> If every life is a steeple, He's placed you in your context for a reason. Why has He placed you there? To watch over your context, to pray for it, to intercede for it, to notice what's going on, to care for it. You know, if every life is a steeple, I mean, there's some, there's some relevance for you there. I mean, have, have you ever thought of your life that way, that you could be a steeple? That you have been designed to, for people to look up at you and see what God is doing. That you are designed to stand and watch and, and notice what's happening in your context. Because wherever you find yourself, there you will find yourself called. On mission for God. I love what Terry Dorrington said. He said, you know, not, not everyone can be at the motorplex, but that's where God has me, Terry Dorrington. <laughs> I wonder what would happen if you take out his name and his context and put in your own. Yeah, I know not everybody's called to the but that's where God has me, Claire Gagler. What's it for you? Ah, uh, you know, I know not everybody's called to level 21 of the BHP building, but you know, that's where God's called me. Where has he called you? Why does he have you there? He has you there to see what's happening, to notice the needs and the nuances of your community, to see and to be seen. Every life is steeple. He wants every heart ablaze. Have you ever driven past a cathedral at nighttime when the lights are on on the inside? Like during the day, you can't see the stained glass windows, but somehow the church is even more beautiful in the dark than it is in the full light of day. And that inner light, that is such a beautiful picture and representation of how God wants you and I to be for the world. God not only wants to set your heart ablaze in personal worship and love and devotion for Him, of course He wants that but he also wants you to light up your context. Check what it says in Ephesians 5.13. It says, everything exposed by the light becomes visible. Pay attention to this. And everything that is illuminated becomes a light. You've been illuminated and you will become a light. God has done a work in you. Do you remember when you first felt like you woke up to God? that first sunrise in your soul when, you know, that time where you, you answered the knocking on the door of your heart where Jesus was knocking and you opened the door and He didn't just come into your heart, He came in and He turned on all the lights as well. What has He lit up in you? What darkness has He lifted in you? What heaviness has He taken away from you? Do you remember the first relief when you sensed His peace and it didn't make sense because you shouldn't really be peaceful, but you had it anyway? Do you remember that relief? That first wave of love when you realise no matter what you do, it will never separate you from the love of God. When was the last time you felt like your heart was ablaze for Jesus? See, the world doesn't need a half-hearted church, like a cup of tea sit on the bench for too long. It doesn't need it. It needs the church ablaze, lit from within with the power and the presence of God. 
The world needs a church that can't help but radiate light and beauty and God's goodness to everybody who encounters it. You see, you may have had a personal revelation of Jesus, you may have encountered Him personally, but it was never intended to stay personal. Here's another way to put it, says Jesus in Matthew 5. You're here to bring light, bringing out the God colours in the world. God is in some secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to make you a light and then hide you under a bucket, do I? No, I'm going to put you on a stand. And now that I've put you on a hilltop, now that you're on a light stand, shine. Keep open house. Be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you're gonna open them up to God, this generous Father in heaven. You know, in a city that feels so dark, for so many people, God has designed the church to be lamps. Every church is a lamp. Every church in every city, like a lamp on a stand. And as He walks amongst the lampstands of the city of Perth, it's our role, Riverview Church, to shine outwards, not for our own glory, but so that people have the light to see Jesus. So as He walks in their situation, we can shine a light on Him and they can see Him and He can be glorified. Here's a takeaway that I want you to have today. You're a lamp. You're not the light. Jesus is the light. You're the lamp. Jesus is the light. 2 Corinthians 4 says this. It's not on the screen, so listen up. For God who said, let there be light in this darkness has made this light shine in our hearts so we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. We now have this light shining in our hearts and this makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. Here's the thing. If you think that illuminating yourself and finding out more about yourself and like really sorting yourself out first before you start to follow Jesus, is gonna bring you the light and the understanding that your context needs. You got it backwards. You see, it's important for us, of course, to know who we are becoming and who God has made us to be. But here is the promise from Jesus Christ. When He calls people to be on mission, He calls them to follow Him. And what is His promise from Mark 1? Follow me and I will make you. If you wanna know who you are in Christ, if you wanna know who you are becoming, if you wanna know who this church is becoming, you don't need to have the light and the illumination to have figured it out first. You don't need to have come and like have all your junk sorted out before you start following Jesus. Jesus. It's in the following that He does the making. It's in the following that we do the becoming. What that means is that your eyes need to be on Jesus. If your eyes are navel gazing, if you're insular and you're shining your light inwards, you're nothing but a shiny, useless lamp. You need the light of Christ in you to fill you up and to pour you into your local context. When the Jesus is our collective focus, the people of this church will shine. There is no doubt about it. So what is the light God has put in you? What is the light He has put in you? Is it His peace? Maybe it's His kindness, His graciousness, that sense of purpose that He's gifted you. What is that light that He has given you? Is that what your neighbours and the people in your context are seeing? Is that the light that they're experiencing from you? You know, I had someone say to me yesterday, how are you standing with all that's going on for you? Encouraging, right? How are you standing with all this happening for you? And I like, to be honest, I had to like bite my tongue, hey? Because like I've been prepping this message and this like old 70s preacher's words came back to me and I was just like, well, you know what? I'm just too blessed to be stressed. (laughs) Oh, I'm too anointed to be disappointed. I'm too equipped to be whipped. I'm too serene to be mean. I'm too grateful to be hateful. You take away the old preacher, you replace it with the Scripture. I may be pressed in on every side, but I am not crushed. I might be perplexed, but I'm not in despair. I am not, I might have had people coming after me, but I'm not abandoned. I might be pressed on every side, not crushed. I'm not, I might be struck down, I'm not destroyed. Because I carry around in me this broken jar of clay, the light and the knowledge and the power and the all-surpassing greatness of Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. You know what, if there's any light in me and you're wondering how I'm still standing, let me tell you, that light's directly from Him. And if He can do it for me, He can do it for you. If He can do it for me, He can do it for you. Come on, Riverview. I want you to stir up your faith today. Ephesians 5 says this, wake up, sleeper. Rise from the dead and let Christ shine in you. That's a word for us today as a church. Wake up, sleeper. Rise from the dead. Let Christ shine in you. Hey, if your faith is asleep today, it's time to wake it up. On the way here this afternoon, I I set my alarm for 3.15 a.m. instead of p.m. Wake up, sleeper. (laughs) Wake up, sleeper. Do you remember the heady days of your first faith? 
when he first encountered the living God, the sun rose different, didn't it? The, the, the day after you met Jesus, it felt different in the morning, right? Remember when that first rush of being connected with your Creator, of knowing that you were made on purpose, for a purpose, with love and with intention. You need to restore the joy of your first love, the joy of your salvation. You know, you need to re-experience the lightness in your step when He released you from the bondage of sin and death. His yoke is easy, His burden is light. You need to remember that. You know, you need to stir up the hot coals of your faith. You know, you say, yeah, I used to be ablaze for Jesus. I used to be on fire for Him. But now I'd, I'm not on fire anymore. All I have is these little embers, these little hot coals. All you need is for the Holy Spirit to blow fresh breath, fresh wind, fresh power on those coals. You watch him go, you say, I'm so dry, I'm so drained. You know what, I don't know if I have it in me to be a passionate Christian anymore. You watch him drop one match on that dry tinder of your, of your heart and watch that thing explode. You know what, God can do incredible things. You just need to let Him. You need to let Him bring power to your world. If your world is dim today, maybe you say, I have a light. And when you said, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't give you a light so it would be put under a bucket. You're like, I, I kind of feel like I'm under a bucket. And if it's hard to see goodness, and if it's hard to see your next step, and if it's hard to meet the need, and if it's hard to know what to do today, God doesn't want you to burn yourself out trying to figure it out. He doesn't want you to burn yourself out trying to be the light that everybody needs you to be. He wants to be that light for you. He wants to pour His light into your life so that He can do the shining for you. You know, if life has wearied your faith, if circumstances have buried your light, God wants you to know that His fire is still available for you today. You might have been struck down, but you haven't been destroyed. He wants to light you up. Light for your path, light for your eyes, light while you wait, light for the darkness. I see people looking for intellectual answers like it's gonna bring them the illumination that they are seeking. I see people wanting the job to bring them that sense of purpose, like I'll know what I'm doing if I get that job. I see people wanting the money and the house and the fit and the car and like the cloud and the followers and it's, they think it's gonna bring them the light. But that's just fake lights. At best, they're like a flash in the pan across your life. They're never gonna have the heat and the warmth and the brightness and the power and the presence of God. You know what? Some of us need to stop thinking, how do I need to be a Christian? What do I need to do to, to be a Christian? You need to stop acting like a Christian. Just start being one. Just start following Jesus. You need to let Him bring His light. Let, him, let the presence of God fill you. How does that happen? Let's go back to Ephesians 5. I love this verse. Wake up, sleeper. It's a word for today. Rise from the dead. It's Christ who will shine in you. It's Christ. So how do you live like that? It says, be very careful then. Be very careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Some of you have those business cards. Use them. They're an opportunity. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. What does the Lord want you to do? He wants you to shine. Don't get drunk on wine because that will ruin your life. That's a word. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs amongst yourself. Yes, worship team, can you get up here? Because I feel like I can't preach about singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs without you guys. But Josh, no sleepy songs. You got it? Alrighty, so... Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, says this translation, and give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, if you wanna be filled with God's light, you need to be filled with His Spirit. If you wanna be filled with His Spirit, you need to worship. You need to speak to each other in songs. It says songs from the soul, songs from your heart. It's not enough to say, Dan sings so well, God, can that be my worship? Can I just like ride on his coattails today, ride on his vocal licks? Cause he's like got that real down. And he's, no, it's not enough. It needs to be songs from your soul, your gratefulness, your thankfulness to God. C.S. Lewis says it's in the process of being worshiped that God communicates his presence to people. You know, we don't worship to fill this room with people. We worship so the people in this room are filled. It's not a building that God wants to fill, it's hearts. And of course the buildings follow, but it's hearts first. Richard Foster says, as worship begins in holy expectancy, 
Do you have a holy expectancy for worship today? Did you walk into this place expecting something to happen while you worshiped or did, was it crowded out by all of the thoughts of your day and of getting a parking spot and the fences are up so I had to walk for Do you have a holy expectancy in worship? Because it starts there and it ends in holy obedience. Holy obedience saves worship from becoming an opiate and escape from the pressing needs of modern life. Worship is more than a feel good, Riverview. Worship ushers in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Worship welcomes Him into your heart and into this room. And when you're filled with the presence of God, that's when He shines. When He lights you up, He will lift you up. There is nothing wrong with desiring the tangible experiential presence of God. There is everything right with it. There's nothing wrong with wanting to experience His presence again and be filled again with the tangible presence of God. If you sacrifice your time and your sleep and your dinner plans and all that and stay back for encounter tonight, I can guarantee you that His presence will be here in a way that you can't experience in any other context other than in the church when it's singing psalms, hymns and spiritual songs to each other because He says that His Spirit will be there. You know, we're filled to be poured out. We're illuminated to be a light. We worship Him so that we can be in His presence, to be filled with His presence, to carry His presence into the places that He's placed us. Worship keeps the fire of my first love burning, you know. It's my personal revelation of Jesus Christ that brings relief to my neighbourhood. It's my hope in Him that I can pass on to others to be the hope of the world. It's my joy in Him that brings joy into desperate situations. It's my lightness of living and my lightness of being that I can pass on to others and it's all because of Him. Worshipping reminds me who He is. Worshipping reminds me what He's like, what He can do. When we worship, we fill ourselves with His presence and that's what God wants. Would you stand up with me? Don't think about leaving because we're not done. God wants you filled. God wants you filled. You can say this, we're gonna get ready to sing in a moment. And I've asked the team not to do a reflection song because I don't think it's time for a reflection. I think it's time for a declaration of faith and a declaration of God, I wanna be filled with your spirit. So if you would like to be filled with the Holy Spirit again tonight, if you would like, you feel like you're saying, hey, that's me, I've been under a bucket. I feel like I've had hot coals and I wanna burst into flame again. I wanna reawaken that first love that I had, that I first experienced when I first met Jesus Christ. I wanna remember that, I wanna experience that again. If that's you, would you raise your hand? I'm gonna pray for you, then we're gonna sing a praise song together. I see that, come on, hands up across the room. If that's you, you want the Holy Spirit to fill you again. God wants you filled. He doesn't want a church that hides in the dark. So Jesus, help us not to be a church that navel gazes, a church that hides its light, but one that is open and revealing of who you are, bringing out all of the God colours in the world. He wants to raise you up, Riverview Church. He wants to put you on a light stand. So for each and every heart that is raised up to you tonight, Lord Jesus, would you pour out your Spirit? Would you pour out every blessing, every reminder, every fresh bit of energy and passion into our church? God, would you light us up again so that we can glorify you? We don't wanna be a church that is caught asleep. We don't wanna be a church that's dead in the ground. We wanna be raised up. We speak to our souls. We say, dead man, get out of the grave. I'm a 